Hello, Mark. Oh, there we go. Hello, everyone. We are honored to have Michelle back again with her to talk about accessibility more than just disability accommodation. Um, just a reminder, I want to have all cell phones turned off. Also, uh, to keep, please keep your mask on while indoors. As well, if you had any more questions for Michelle after the panel, uh, you can find her at the Happiness Lounge. And also there's an after party to celebrate us uh, coming back to WordCamp in person. So without further ado, here is Michelle. So good to be here. It's so good to be presenting in person again after all these years. I am super excited, super honored to be selected to speak here today and I want to thank you for joining me. Um, I didn't do one of those slides that tells you all about me, but I will give you just the quick and dirty down low is that I am the Director of Community Engagement for Stellar WP. Um, at Stellar we have a host of suite, uh, suite of plugins everything from GiveWP to Cadence to um, Restrict Content Pro, the events calendar, all of those wonderful things. And I'm also the Director of Community Relations for Post Status. And I do a lot of writing and event coordination for Post Status. And I love Big Orange Heart. I'm the president of the board over at Big Orange Heart. Um, one of the projects that I also run is called Underrepresented in Tech. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit when I'm talking through this presentation today. And if you are ever looking for a job in WordPress, I do have a site called wpcareerpages.com. Um, and that's just a gift to the WordPress world. Um, during lockdown, I had to take some vacation. I didn't know what to do with it, so I built wpcareerpages.com. And most Wednesdays, I tweet out job openings that I learn about. So if you are learning, looking for any of those things, I do try to give back to the community as much as possible. So today I want to talk about accessibility, but not web accessibility. I don't want to talk about how to make your screen readers work. I don't want to talk about um, you know, contrasting colors. I did my slides in black and white because I want them to be as accessible as possible. But that's not what we're really here to talk about today. We're here to talk about the table and that the table is bigger than you think it is. Web accessibility is super important. I don't want to not talk about that. I do want to say how important that is. Uh, screen readers are important. Um, people with motor skill issues, paying attention to um, neurodivergence, people with hearing impairment, all of the things that we need to really pay attention to for accessibility, ally, as we call it, um, you really do want to pay attention to those things. Color, navigation. Um, I, I think I put screen readers on there twice because it's that important and it was this morning and I wasn't paying attention, but <laughs> web accessibility is super important. But like I said, we're not talking about that today. Today we are talking about what inclusion in WordPress means for underrepresented groups and why that's important. So one of the things I mentioned is I co-founded um, a project. It's not an organization. It isn't a 501c3. It's literally just, like I say, we, it's a gift to the WordPress community. It's a project called Underrepresented in Tech, and it is at underrepresentedintech.com. It's all about creating opportunities and helping people find connections for underrepresented folks in the WordPress community to other organizations and projects. It is completely opt-in. We do not charge a fee to join our database. If you are an underrepresented person, if you are older than most people in tech, if you are a woman, if you are a part of the LGBTQ community, if you're neurodivergent, if you are handicapped, disabled, how, whatever words you want to use for yourself, I use both of those for myself, um, if you are part of an ethnic minority, you are somebody who is entitled to be in the underrepresented in tech database. It is always free to join. We have guaranteed to each other, Ali Nimmons and I, who founded it with me, that we will never charge people to be part of that database. We will also never charge people to search that database. 
And we got questions about that at the beginning. Well, I understand not charging people to be in the database, but why wouldn't you at least charge the white people <laughs> to search the database? And the truth is that as soon as you start to charge access to underrepresented folks and minorities, you're still taxing the underrepresented folks and minorities because not everybody's going to pay for that access. And that still disadvantages people in our community. So it will always be free to search the database as well. One of the things that our, our project does is help fight that imposter syndrome. Tells people you belong here. We've got a database that's just for you, and there are people who are searching that database and finding people to be on their podcasts, to contribute to their projects, to contribute to their blogs, and to find part-time and full-time work, to be speakers at events, and to be organizers for events. That database is there for people not to be outed, so nobody can enter other people into it, but so that you can be part of it if you choose to opt in. And like I said, it is not a 501c3. Any contributions we get, which are usually in-kind contributions, so we do have some sponsorships, um, we do have uh, use of certain plugins and hosting that has been gifted to move the project forward. It is not a revenue generator for us. There is a tip jar, and we don't ever ask anybody to give it, but the only reason that it's there is because people begged us to put it there. So over the course of two years, I think we've been gifted about $1,000. If you were to take $1,000 and divide it over the two of us and the number of hours that we put into underrepresented in tech, it's about 25 cents an hour that we've earned. So if you want to call that revenue, you can. But the reason we founded it is because I, as somebody in the community who advocates for others, and Allie, somebody in the community who advocates for others, we're constantly being direct messaged in so many different er arenas, whether it was text or Slack or Twitter or Facebook, asking, hey, do you know somebody who's in the black community? Do you know somebody who's underrepresented? Do you know somebody who's Hispanic? Like literally, specifically questions like that. Who could be on my podcast? Who might want to join our, our group. And the thing is, it's not our responsibility to offer up specific names of people who may or may not be interested in having their names offered up. Originally, we were going to start a spreadsheet and just like keep a list of people that we could recommend. And then that even felt invasive. And the whole idea is that if you are an underrepresented person and you want to be found, this is a good way to do it. And it puts it in your own hands to do it. So that's kind of how I got started in working as, well, I am an underrepresented person, but also with un other underrepresented people to make WordPress more accessible to everybody. Um, not only do we have the website, but we also have a podcast. We post about once a week. We do take a break now and then. Um, and we talk about some of the hard-hitting questions, and we're not afraid to pull punches. And it's just an open conversation between the two of us, sometimes a guest about the things that we see from everything from racism, performative um, allyship, and misogyny, and everything else that we encounter, um, ableism, sexism, all of those things. Um, and so we talk about those things in an open way with each other. But the reason is because we want WordPress and the WordPress community to be more inclusive. We want people to be in the seats they want to be in as we move forward with WordPress and not to feel like they can't climb above a certain rank or find a certain position that they want to be in in the community. Whether that's a paid position, whether it's a voluntary position, whatever it is, we want to make it more accessible to everybody. Let's start with events. We'll talk about events. There have been so many white people speaking at events over the history of, let's say, WordCamps, for example. There have been so many white people organizing WordCamps. And part of that is because it starts with a couple people who say, hey, we're friends. We live in the same city. Let's start a WordCamp, and we'll invite our friends. And so you have this little homogenous group of people that start to do something really good. Is it bad that a bunch of friends decide they're going to do something awesome like that? Of course not. But 
we can make it even better if we do some things to make it more inclusive and make it more inviting and appealing and welcoming. One of those things is, how are you inviting people? If you put out a call for speakers, for example, that's awesome. But are you doing more than just making a speaker application page available? A few years ago, it might have even been four or five years ago at this point, I have pandemic brain now, and time is this like fake construct anymore. I don't know how long ago anything happened. I know my daughter's 30, and it was since then. But there was a conference in Europe, and I don't even remember what it was, so if you ask me, I won't recall. But it came under scrutiny because they put out their call for speakers, and then they put out their list of chosen speakers. And there was 10 speakers throughout that day, nine of them white males, and one of them an Asian male. And that was it. Not a single woman was invited to be a speaker. They got called out for it publicly. And initially, they pushed back, saying, well, we put out the call. If women don't apply, that's not our fault. It's out there. Anybody can apply. And yeah, that's true, right? Anybody can apply. But are you making that application process an inviting application process? If I go to your event and I look at the last five years of speakers and I see only white men, do I think it's a safe space for a woman to apply to speak? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But you haven't shown me that it is. So how are you inviting people? What are the images you're putting out there? Are you actually doing outreach? Are you going to something like underrepresentedintech.com? Are you going to something like Black Girls Code? Are you going to something like Women in Code? Are you looking at spaces where you can do outreach specifically to invite people from underrepresented groups to be part of that event? If you are not, you're not doing it right because you have to do the work if you want an inclusive event. That event took a little bit of heat they then invited a woman to be one of those speakers. <gasps> wow. Guess what? She didn't want to do it because she didn't want to be tokenized. They asked another woman. She didn't want to do it because she didn't want to be tokenized. The men who were listed started to withdraw from that, saying, I don't want to be on a panel that's taking this much heat. And the event was canceled. And that's just one example of what happens when we don't seek to have inclusion in our events. What does your call for speaker look like? What is your call for sponsors and organizers and volunteers? Are you asking people to join? I'm part of Big Orange Heart. We have twice a year for the last two years done WordFest. At WordFest, we don't just put out a call for speakers and hope that people will apply. We go out and ask people to apply. We never guarantee a spot because I might ask you to apply, you might apply, and I hate your topic. <laughs> <laughs> or it doesn't fit with WordFest, or you know, we do a blind ranking first and it may come out with like the bare bottom. So I can't guarantee a spot, but we definitely want to get all kinds of people applying with all kinds of topics. And so it's important to us to make sure that we are actually recruiting and doing the research to make our events accessible. I said it wasn't going to be about physical accessibility or disability accessibility. But I do have to say, take a step back on that a little bit. You know, you might have seen me around here with my scooter. I don't walk very well. So I have to make sure that when I'm at an event, I can actually get to the event. Things like curb cuts to be able to make sure that I can get up onto the sidewalks. Things like elevators if things are on the second floor. Those are super important for somebody. If you want me to come speak, I have to actually be able to get on the stage. If I had to come down this in the aisle, walk up the stairs, that would be a hardship for me. Luckily for me, I could just roll in off the back, come in from backstage, and they made this a, made sure that I had an accessible space to be able to participate. This is a school. It should be accessible. However, I have to ask somebody to help me get in and outside from the outdoors, because the doors don't open with, with a push, right? They're not electronic. The bathroom has a handicapped accessible um, symbol on it. But I can't open the door and drive through it. I can't, when I'm, once I'm in there, I'm great. 
but it still isn't as accessible as it should be. And that's a hardship. Like, if I have to constantly, if I have to go find a friend to let me in the bathroom, that's not an accessible situation. So while this has been a great event, and I have amazing friends here, and I would ask a stranger because I'm not embarrassed to do that, not everybody in my situation would feel as comfortable being in my shoes. So think about those things when you have events. We had WordCamp St. Louis in 2019. That was the last one we've had in person so far. I was on the org team, and I said, are the rooms near enough to each other that somebody who walks with a, a cane, because that's, that's where I was at that time, this was before scooters, <laughs> before my scooter, could get from room to room without it being a hardship for them. And I was assured that it was, because the year prior in Nashville, it was a nightmare. The place where I was situated as a sponsor versus where lunch was was probably a half mile walk. That's how big the event was. The first day, I walked down there, and I was almost in tears because I knew I had to walk back. <laughs> I couldn't just live in the lunchroom. And for somebody using a mobility assisted aid like a cane, that was incredibly difficult. So the next year, I said, are you sure everything's close by? Luckily, I did have a scooter because even though I was assured everything was near to each other, it wasn't. And if I had been using a cane, I would have gone back to the hotel and said, I'll see you guys next year, because it was that it would have been that difficult. Ask somebody who's in the situation. Don't assume, because you have two legs that work well, that that's not far. Because somebody who is on oxygen, somebody who's using a walker, somebody who's using a cane, has a different idea of what's too far than you do. So make sure that your events are not only inviting to the, uh, to the underrepresented um, community, but also accessible once they arrive. One of the things that I think companies don't think about enough is that if you have a more diverse and underrepresented community within your company, you develop better products for the community. Products who are reviewed, reviewed by different user groups, different um, underrepresented groups, are better for it. In the 50s, all of the advertising and marketing was done by men. Vacuum cleaners were sold as sexy, right? There was pictures, like every advertisement was this really happy woman in a pointy bra, a full skirt, a little apron, her pearls pushing her hoover. And men like were like, oh, look how much she's going to love that. I'm going to give that to her for her birthday. That sucked. <laughs> Don't do that. See, the truth is that men didn't ask women what they wanted. Men didn't ask women those kinds of things. Didn't say, what would make a woman want to buy this vacuum cleaner? Because it wasn't pushing it around in high heels. I got that much to tell you. It was when my kid spills cereal, is this going to pick it up? <laughs> and so having people look at those products from different perspectives makes a big difference. Uh, in the, within the last year, there was a post in a Facebook group, and a woman said to the plugin developer, hey, and she tried to use humor because we women often have to use humor to be taken seriously, otherwise we're called a bitch or anything else. She said, hey, I noticed that it says super admin. He will be or he will have control. But they were not primarily English speakers who developed this, so they made a mistake. And they said, oh my gosh, I can't believe we did that. Absolutely, we can fix that. But men in the group, one in particular, just came after. They said, if you change that, I will never use this product again. If it's so offensive to you, pluck your eyes out. And that's the kind of thing that says, clearly, there's an issue here. If they had said, hey, English speakers, <laughs> can somebody review this documentation? Anybody, male or female, would have said, or non-binary, would have said, why does it say he? 
Like, there are women who are super admins. There are non-binary folks that are super admins. Why does it have to be gendered at all? But it wasn't reviewed that way. They responded perfectly well, and they made the adjustment. But it just goes to show that if you're not asking multiple groups of people to review what it is that you're offering, you're missing the opportunity for a more inclusive product, whether that's documentation, whether that's how the product is used, what the dashboard side of things looks like, what's intuitive to a couple of white male developers might not be intuitive to the rest of us. And so having more inclusion on your team gives you better opportunity to review those things. Does it work for everyone? Are you marketing it right? This really does affect your sales. And if it doesn't affect your initial sales, it's going to affect your renewals, and it's going to affect your ratings. And those affect sales. It gives you better projects. So if you are a podcaster and somebody looks at your list of people that you've interviewed and had as guests on your podcast and they see a bunch of white guys, are they going to say, hey, I want to be on your podcast? Or are they going to feel left out of that? Now, there are some women like me who will be like, yo, you need more diversity. Want me to come on? <laughs> Not everybody is as ballsy as I am. Can I say that on here? I don't know. <laughs> But not everybody is as forthcoming and as confident as I am. And that's true for men and women. And so in order for you to have more diversity on your podcast, on your blog, in your workshops, on your webinars, you have to seek it. You have to look for patterns in your own past. And you have to be, make it easy for somebody to be able to be a part of what it is you do. I have a podcast. I have a page that says, hey, I want to be on your podcast. People can fill it out. It doesn't automatically schedule them because I don't want the bots coming for me <laughs> and my schedule. But then I can review who it is. I can respond accordingly, give them that calendar, and let them apply. I don't just leave it open for that, though. I ask people to be on the podcast. I go out and make sure that I have just as many women as I do men, that I have people of color, that I have non-binary folks, that I have people in the LGBTQ community. Because I think it's important in a podcast that is telling the stories of people in WordPress, that I'm telling the, the stories of all the people in WordPress that want to be told, and that it's an inclusive environment, so that if somebody looks at my podcast, they don't say, she only interviews the white guys, she only wants the people at the top, because that's not how it is. I think stories are important. It's part of our rich history, and it's part of how we move forward. Again, do your outreach. It will make a better team. If you have more people on the team, how are you recruiting for, your, for people at your, at your place of employment? Are you recruiting or are you just hoping that you'll get some diversity by some miracle? And I use diversity and inclusion interchangeably sometimes, but the truth is inclusion is different than diversity. Diversity can be, I hired people because of their gender, because of their skin color, because of their sexual orientation. And that's the only reason. Inclusion means I hired somebody because the work they did is amazing, they're good for that job, and they are underrepresented. So I'm getting that richness, but I'm not doing it through tokenization. I'm doing it because I'm getting really good people on my team and making my team better because of it. What does your application look like on your website? Do you have pictures of your team and everybody in your team is a white face? Everybody on your team is, ma is a male and you're trying to recruit otherwise? Ditch the pictures. Show what you really want. Say it and as much say. We want to grow the diversity and inclusion on our team. We want you to apply. I had somebody, I do a lot of um, inclusion consulting now for hiring through underrepresented in tech. And I had somebody say, can you look at our application page? We're not getting any women applying. I don't know why. And so as I read down prior to the spot, like there's this much text before you even get to the part of like actually applying for the job. So that's great because some of it is job description. What am I applying for? But when you got through that first part, this sentence appeared. If you think you might be a good fit. Now, most people, and I'm going to say most men, aren't going to even see a problem with that. Because, yeah, I'm a good fit. Why wouldn't I be, right? But somebody who's in an underrepresented group, somebody who's a woman, might look at that and those self-doubts that they already have 
that imposter syndrome that's already part of their psyche says, if I think I might, I'm probably not. And you just missed out or potentially missed out on an amazing team member. All you have to do at the bottom of that is say, please apply below. Like, basically, if you've made it this far, you've already made up your mind if you think you might be good. Don't plant the seeds of doubt. Always err on the side of hundreds of applications that you can winnow down to the ones that you really want to interview, as opposed to letting people self-select out who actually might have been a really good fit for you. So are you using inclusive language? Are you using language that encourages? Are you discouraging people? And make it easy to apply. You know, how do you do the interview? How do you do emails? What is the language that you're using in all of those things? And then I, we, in, we reviewed somebody else who asked for a photo and a date of birth. And I said, if you're not getting a lot of women applying, it's because you just asked for a photo and a date of birth. If you need those things once you hire somebody, that's when you ask for them. You should never ask for a picture of somebody. You should never ask their ethnicity. You should never ask their date of birth. You should never ask their weight, for sure. Um, but you should never ask those things as part of the application because those things don't have an impact on how they do their job and what their skill sets are, what their qualifications are. If you need a date of birth to process payment, Payroll, absolutely, ask for it then at the time that you're hiring them. If you need a headshot for your website, great. Ask for it at the time that you hire them. Don't ask for it in your application process. There is something called Equal Pay Day here in the United States. And I can't see with my glasses on my computer screen. But Equal Pay Day is the day of the, the year that a woman has to work into the next year to have the equal pay to what a man made in the same job the year before. So for example, if a guy makes $50,000 in one year, it might take a woman to March, I think it's March 31st, to make $50,000 in the same exact role. Equal pay day is a thing we've known about, it's tweeted about every year, but what you don't know is that it even gets worse when you apply under representation to some of those things. An Asian or Pacific Islander, it's February. A black woman, it's August, to make the same amount of money that her male counterpart did the year before. Native American woman, it's October. And a Latina woman, it's November, which means a Latina woman usually has to work almost two years to make the same amount of money that a man does in the same role. So if you're truly looking for inclusion, Look at how much you're paying people and pay them for the job they do, not because of their gender or their skin color. So I have a secret. The secret is there really is no table. We talk about making room at the table. The table is figurative. When I was growing up, we had a big family. There were only three of us kids, but my dad was one of 11. And when we all got together for Thanksgiving, there was like tables stretched out across and then there was the kids' tables, and then there was the other kids' table, and like we were literally all over the house. And there was only so much room at the table, and we had to try to squeeze chairs in, right? When we're talking about making room at the table for people who are underrepresented, just make the table bigger. Like, there is no table. It's a figurative table. It's a metaphor. You don't have to try to make room. You can just make the table bigger. You don't even have to actually go to a wood shop to do it, because there's no real table. Just make a space that makes it more inclusive for people. You can always make more room. Yes, I know that there are budgetary concerns. I know that there are things that make it difficult to just add more people. But if you're hiring, make sure that that table accommodates inclusiveness. Because there's no such thing as crowding at a figurative table. Nobody has to sit at the kids' table. And we can have more than one table. It's all about intention. And valuing people makes the difference. So if we can value people for the, who they are, their skills, and everything that they bring with their experience and where they're coming from that make everything so much better and so much richer, you are that much better off. As I said, intention is everything. You have to intend to make 
a more inclusive space. You have to intend to make it accessible. You have to understand your privilege. You have to understand why it is you want diversity or inclusion. Is it performative? Is it tokenization? Is it so that you can have a picture on the website that isn't all white guys? You have to do the work to create the right environment. You have to have the right intention. You have to understand what the barriers to participation are if you're the one building them. And you have to know how to open opportunities for other people. Those of us with privilege have the responsibility to level the playing field. Because people without privilege, they can try to demand it, but we're the ones who have to say yes. We're the ones who have to open that door, we're the ones who have to lower those barriers, and we're the ones who have to make WordPress a more inclusive space. I'm Michelle Frechette. All of my contact information is there. You can reach me through any of those million different places. I have my DMs open everywhere. I talk to people all the time. I give advice where I can. I will answer your questions. Um, if it goes too in-depth, I do have to charge for my time because I only have so much of it. But I am always, always, always open to helping people do better in WordPress and make the world and the WordPress world and their community better for each other. And I'd love your questions if you have any. <laughs> I'm a little passionate about it. I hope that's maybe came through a little. <laughs> questions? Yes. How far is it from wherever you were to lunch at a restaurant mm -hmm. or whatever? What you perceive as one distance to someone who doesn't have the limitations you do, they see it as a different distance. What I think has to be done is they have to perceive the distance as if they were you so they can understand yeah. the, the issue. And, and the other thing I wanted to say is Progress is sometimes made in little areas because I don't know how they, they went about doing it. When I started my career as an engineer, or not my career, col college in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, there were two women pretty much in all my classes. When I got to graduate school and was a TA at the University of Connecticut, it was almost 50-50. And we're talking, they, you know, I worked for a few years after I graduated. So we're talking over a seven-year period, uh, you know, two different schools, but still the student body, you know, changed considerably. And I don't even know what the impetus was. I didn't know what it was. The effort to do it was imperceivable to me. It just seemed like it organically happened, for instance. I'm not sure what your question is. Well, that was... That, that was the first thing was a question. The second one was more of a comment okay. that sometimes progress is made in ways that we don't always understand, but to go from a, you know two women out of 30 or something okay. to 15 and 15 practically in six or seven years is a significant change mm -hmm. in thought philosophy that these women who may have never thought about doing this you know, decided that mm -hmm. it was a career for them. So, so the, for your first question about how do how would somebody understand my perspective, being somebody with a disability, if they don't know the answer, they should ask somebody who does. You need to do the research. You need to do the work in order to make a, a space more inclusive. So, if you don't know what's too far, then you ask somebody who is a disability specialist to come in and evaluate the situation. And I'm not a specialist, but I can come in and tell you if it's too far or not <laughs> because I experience it, right? If you don't know, then you need to ask and get somebody involved who does. Um, the second point that you made, uh, not understanding maybe how we went from 20, to, uh, two, men to, or two women to 30 women, somebody was doing the work. Somebody was doing the research and somebody was doing the outreach because it doesn't happen otherwise. It's just that you weren't privy to how that was happening. Thank you for being awesome. 
Um, my question is actually kind of unrelated to me right now, but when I was unemployed, a lot of companies were using COVID as a, in my opinion, an excuse to do video resumes. What is your opinion and how should I ever need it in the future? Should I approach a video resume? That's a really good question. I think a video resume during COVID, I can see how it could be useful and it, it's, it depends on the job. Let me start that way. It depends on the job. If you are going to be applying for a job where you're going to be in the public eye and how you carry yourself and your poise um, and how you answer questions and how you interact with people is part of that, I don't necessarily see that as a problem. If you are somebody who is going to be coding, there should never be a reason to have to do a video resume. In some cases, there isn't even a reason to have to do a face-to-face -face interview, believe it or not. So. Any other questions? Thank you for hanging in here, listening to me just kind of go on and on. Whether you agree or not, it's so good just to have people in the room who want to learn and want to hear what I have to say about it. Listen to other people who are like me. Listen to the people who are less um, represented than you are and believe them when they tell you what the difficulties are for them in the space and strive to do better to make those spaces less difficult for people who aren't as privileged. Thank you. Christine works with me, so she's got to take a picture of her, her twin.